I'm Michelle Arantia, the Executive Director of the Children's Advocacy Center. I'm Jessica Karinskis. I'm the CSEC Manager at the Children's Advocacy Center in Bristol County. I'm Mark Montigny, the State Senator from New Bedford and the surrounding towns, and a longtime leader of the anti-human trafficking effort, which ties in to the amazing work that the CAC is doing to uh, literally save children's lives. Uh, just a little bit of context about the issue of child trafficking. Um, Senator Montigny has really been instrumental for a very long time in understanding the issue um, and trying to address the issue through legislation. And we came to understand a lot about this. You know, who are these kids? Where are they? Uh, what are the factors that go into it? So this education process back in 2015 and this awareness, as you know, education and awareness, right, leads to increased reporting. DCF also simultaneously did some great work to address compliance with the legislation, but also recognition that there was a disproportionate amount of these kids who were in DCF care. These were kids who have grown up in the system, who were so easily um, lured into the life of exploitation because they want something more different. Uh, they want a different level of connection. These are incredibly vulnerable youth, and not all. I mean, we've had cases from North Attleboro. We've got Dartmouth cases. Um, so it's not it's yes. not it's not just cities. Ninety percent of kids, all kids that have been exploited, have been victims of child sexual abuse. Poly victimization is a is a very real issue because it's the impact of trauma, right? Yes. So choice making, the adverse childhood experiences, you can you can see on that as you go through this continuum of impact of trauma, impact on your neurodevelopment, uh, choice making, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's all related. In the odd country of Cambodia, I met with traffickers after I filed the bill, uh, uh, anti trafficking advocates, and they said, um, "There's nothing you can do." Yeah. I, it's a typical American question, how can we help? And they said, you know how you can help? You can help like every other leader in a Western country because most of our problems come from sex tourism and the buyers are coming from not so much America because Americans don't travel, uh, but from European countries. So their problem was that the buyers with all the money were coming from right. European countries and they mentioned countries like Russia, but it isn't just Russia. We all love to right now make that the, uh, uh, you know, the whipping country. But here's the bottom line. It's trafficking in child rape. And that's what I mean by shifting the paradigm and why it's so horrifying watching the meager statistics. So the blame doesn't go, uh, or the finger shouldn't be pointed at law enforcement or prosecutors. And I've certainly been critical and they've pushed back. It's the shift in society. We still have that mentality. Michelle and I didn't coordinate notes, but I've often said how historically we almost glorified pimps. They protect these vulnerable women. They may be jerks, but I mean, come on, look at just look at movies in the 70s. The tough guys were, you know, uh, were, were the pimps. No, they're not, especially with children. They are rapists and they are trafficking in rape. You cannot buy a child willingly. It's statutory rape by statute. When somebody sees that child on the corner, since most of this is done at the local level. Most of the policing, most of the most of the saving of the life and the, and the preserving of life is done at the local level. Most people have the reaction I had when I read the New York Times article in 2006. That's someone else's problem. Some of the worst abuses, uh, worst abuse cases in the adult exploitation have been in suburbs around Boston. It's been nannies that come in from foreign countries and the Jones are competing with the Smiths and all of a sudden the passport is confiscated and the the, you know, the little nanny who, who doesn't show up much in the outside um, because she's being exploited, sometimes sexually, sometimes just commercially, without uh, uh, you know, pay and the promises. With children, though, I look at it as a it's far, far more insidious, but it's also the responsibility of every single person in this city, in the suburbs, in this state, in this country. It isn't disproportionate in New Bedford or in Boston. It's happening, and it's exponentially increased because of uh, addiction. Uh, but at the end of the day, if someone sees a child on the street and assumes they're just a delinquent and it's sad and I say a prayer, it does nothing. If somebody sees that person as a victim of rape and trafficking, um, maybe there'll be more prosecutions. And if they see the woman as a poor soul who did make bad choices but deserves to be treated, treated as a victim, and if law enforcement is trained properly to look at them as victims, two things happen. There's a chance to save their lives, and by the way, it's expensive. 
it's expensive to save the life of a, of a destroyed person. Um, but the second thing is, we get traffickers off the street. There's still societal, societally um, victim blaming, right? Well, she shouldn't have been there, right? The, the, the notion of victim blaming is so prevalent, which is why it is still such a challenge um, for us to address these social justice issues. If you look at the attention to opioid abuse, you can spend all of your day, and I spent mm -hmm. some of it, really angry at folks that didn't listen when we talked about it mm -hmm. growing up in New Bedford, and now because it's reached Dover and Wellesley, we yeah. should solve it and throw money at it. The good news, you have to look at it as half, the glass yes. half full. The good news is it is everyone's problem now. I am very marginally optimistic the same thing is happening right. here, that once people make that connection, that it isn't some child, I mean, again, I can't, I don't want to seem in any way that I support this, this mentality, but the paradigm shifts when people honestly think it's their problem, yes. and it's not a coincidence that the, the cases where somebody fits a certain little demographic profile and it becomes national news and everyone in the country is looking for the poor missing child, but somebody who fits a, a profile that's commonly abused or commonly missing or commonly, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, a victim, we care less about it. What they're doing is arresting these kids more on shoplifting, assault and battery, but it's the result, and I believe this in my heart, the reason that they're arresting these kids on these charges is because there's no other service provision to keep these kids safe. A lot of a lot of the kids that we see, you know, especially when we talk about kids that are in residential placements or group homes, they're constantly running. So, in an attempt to what feels like quote unquote save them or save them from themselves, law enforcement sometimes chooses to lock them up because at least we know that for that one night or that 30 days that they're safe. However, we also know that putting victims in cuffs is counterproductive to our whole process. Yeah. The traffickers have to be treated as trafficking and rape, and my law actually calls for up to a life sentence. Call up all of the prosecutors in the state of Massachusetts and ask them how many people they think are trafficking children and how many have served a life sentence. Well, what Zero they, have served. They used to be trapped, uh, prosecuted for. They weren't prosecuted, and now they're prosecuted only in, in minimal numbers. What happens is the, and again, things have gotten far better. So post-2011, the law uh, provided what we call a safe harbor provision. So the presumption, in a sense, was that these are children, they need service. Uh, but unless and until you completely decriminalize, and as Michelle said, automatically put the child as a, an exploited victim. I mean, think about it. We have statutory rape laws, but we still have a situation where a child may. It doesn't happen very often at all. I couldn't even cite a case. Maybe you can. Uh, because the shift has uh, begun. But we still have children that are treated every day as child delinquents instead of the victims of trafficking of rape by, by rapists. The public needs to be aware that when they see that child, not to think of them as someone who made a bad choice. Think of them as someone who's being uh, trafficked. But then once you, 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 you are fortunate enough to take that child away from his rapist or her rapist, you have to have a way turn them from a victim into a survivor and it's expensive. You have to stop by making sure they don't have a criminal record. So there are safe harbor provisions, they're not strong enough, but they are in my new bill because they basically say a child is never at fault. And some prosecutors, by the way, have resisted that because they think we then won't have the hook to bring them in and force them to testify. They have this trauma bond with their trafficker or their pimp and that bond is going to keep pulling them back. So our treatment and our provider response has to address that and accept that to help these kids move forward and get out of this life. But we know that survivors and now mentors will tell you that the single most important factor in them finally getting out of the life of exploitation is that they were treated well by a police officer that stuck by them. Right from the beginning, this is why the vacature and the ceiling and the and the safety and training with law enforcement is important. If the victim doesn't feel that she can survive and make that gap and doesn't feel safe, they don't testify and they are much more likely to, to uh, go back out onto the street. A, a drug addiction usually where a parent is pimping out their own child. I, I think of the very first yeah. case that we had, which was a New Bedford case with three siblings, three female siblings. 
Um, and it was the first case that we dabbled with in the fall of 2015. Yeah. And um, it was a mom who was pimping out her three daughters for her drug habit right here in the city. Oftentimes it's a boyfriend. And it's, you know, a boyfriend. And by the way, it doesn't have to be a sophisticated international trafficking ring, although the, they exist. It can be a really bad, abusive boyfriend who's feeding a drug habit or just his own, whatever his, his uh, sick needs are. Um, it's sometimes a gang, a little small, unsophisticated gang, maybe trafficking one member's girlfriend. Um, this amazing survivor spoke at my forum, and she said that it was worse than death because in death, it's over. You either believe you go on somewhere or you don't, but it stops. And in, in, in the case of this, you wake up every day to some uh, hell worse than death. You're just raped and sold and abused. Many times, the drug addiction uh, was the result of, of, of the pimp or, or trafficker, and that's, you know, they continue to keep you in that right. state. The drug use piece is how the pimp gets them hooked on staying connected to them. I mean, sometimes the substance use is already happening, but oftentimes they introduce them to drugs and they use it to self-medicate for the pain that they're experiencing when they're, when they're having um, to have sex with multiple people. I've heard a lot of survivors speak, and I'll rem I remember one in particular who talked about how drugs and alcohol were the only way she survived what happened to her. So it wasn't that her trafficker was using it to get hurt to sell her, but was using it, she was using it as a way to cope with all of the awful things that were happening to her. Right. So I think substance use disorders happen because of all different reasons with this population. Right. There's a lot of money made in selling people, right? Because if you think of some, like a gang who's selling drugs, for, for example, you know, um, they have to have people to get the stuff to make the drug, and they have to have the place to make the drug, and they have to have the people to to distribute the drug. There's a lot of points for law enforcement to intervene in that, because if a state trooper pulls over a guy and he's got a trunk full of cocaine, odds are he's going to get arrested. You have a uh, same guy, you have a 17-year-old guy with two 16-year-olds in the back seat, and they might be commodities just like that drug is, but if that officer is not trained in identifying it, right. they're not going to be able to intervene. Not only that, I mean, if you think about, you know, an ounce of cocaine you can sell one time, you can sell a person 10, 20 times a night, right? There's a lot, a lot of money made in selling You're people. You're not exaggerating 10, 20 times a night? Oh, not exaggerating at all. Just and, and I also, part of this is also the internet, right? Because it used to be people walking on the streets right. that were visual. You could see that this was happening to them. Now the internet is used to recruit, so for pimps or traffickers to reach out and get women and children, you know, to to be victims, um, and they can also use it to sell. So it's not so blatant in people's faces. Uh, so both bills have been refiled. The broader human trafficking bill, which I look at it as a, as that sort of finishing what didn't happen in 2011. Some of it because uh, folks stood in the way, but some of it just because the, all of this is evolving yeah. uh, every day. Uh, oh. The Body Works bill has also been refiled, and again, I want to state very clearly. Both of these bills have passed the Senate repeatedly and died in the House. Just because we are going to put a video up, if there is someone out there suspecting that they're seeing something and just not sure, not sure what to do, what do you tell them? I would tell, so if we're talking about a child, I would tell them to report it to the Department of Children and Families. Okay. Um, there's hotline numbers and then there's local area offices. You can Google it on your phones and find the number in the office to call um, and you want to report it. Um, you can also go to your local police station and report things. It doesn't have to be at DCF. Okay. Mm -hmm. They can call the CAC and we'll help guide them as well. Yeah. Okay. Anyone, we're an information clearinghouse and we'll send, mm -hmm. you know, a local person to, to go help them and, 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 you know, make sure that they're, they're safe and that they're getting what they need. It's our responsibility to look at the child as a victim. So if something looks awry, it probably is. And if it looks criminal, report it criminally. 